plan. Yeah. And sorry about that. So welcome anyone, er, everyone to Plan Ferndale Virtual Summit, session number two, equity and open space. My name is Ryan Myers Johnson, and I have the pleasure of facilitating today's panel discussion with you today. Um, we have a great afternoon planned in which we will take a deep dive into examining issues of equity and open space with our panel, as well as then breaking out into breakout rooms to have deeper conversations with you. And um, I will be joined by uh, several different colleagues. Um, of course, I mentioned that's me, Ryan Myers Johnson, looking good for my headshot, hopefully. Um, our panel would also be uh, featuring Casey uh, Rashito with Detroit Justice Center, Lisa Bryant uh, with the Ferndale Parks Department, Emily O'Bear also with Ferndale Parks, and Alicia Adams with Smith Group. Um, before we dive deep into this discussion, I'm just going to lay out a few uh, guidelines for how we're going to have discourse. So the purpose of this session today really is to hear from you and to be in dialogue with you as we discuss the future of Ferndale and inform uh, Ferndale's master plans. So we really want you to take space. What that means is let your voice be heard. Um, really give your thoughts, give us your dreams, your, your opinions, your concerns. But at the same time, let's please make sure that we're making space for other people. So how do you make space? Maybe ask yourself, am I the only one talking consistently? Am I the first one always talking? And am I allowing space for other people to um, express their feelings as well? So take space, make space. And that also goes for the chat. We want you to really utilize the chat, but you know, ask yourself that again. Am I making space for people to be heard, especially as we have lots of different people coming from lots of different backgrounds. And for some, this may be their first community meeting. So let's definitely make space for everyone's voice to be heard. Um, number two, productive conversation is going to focus on issues, not people. So this is a conversation about equity. So I imagine and I hope that people have a lot of feelings, a lot of strong thoughts about it. Um, however, when we're in these conversations, let's make sure that we are addressing the issues at hand so that we can progressively move Ferndale forward as opposed to statements like, you know, who are you to say such and such? Or where did you come from? Where do you live anyway? Are you even this? So we're not talking about people, we're talking about issues and concepts and systems that we can move forward. Um, number three, I don't think I need to say that because you guys have all dedicated time out of your busy schedules to be here. So I know that we're all planning on listening carefully and deeply being engaged. Number four, do not freeze each other in time. So what that is referring to is uh, being able to progressively move forward. So I think one of the things that happens in my experience with community meetings, especially when it comes to city, is that we're thinking a lot about um, and we're bringing up traumas that have happened in regards to planning and such and community meetings. And we should bring those up. We must bring those up. However, let's allow the city of Ferndale to move and progress and evolve as they receive feedback as well as other people. People have an opportunity to evolve, to grow and to change within these conversations. Number five, challenge oppressive remarks and behaviors, but do not blame or shame. I really hope that we don't have these oppressive remarks and behaviors, but if it does happen, feel free to challenge. But we're again, focusing on issues, not individuals. Number six, practice both and thinking. Let's try to be inclusive with these solutions. We don't wanna cancel people's thoughts, but we can accept and then take it to the next level with some both and type of statements. Um, number seven, the statement has already been made. Please use the time to explore new issues and opportunities. So, you know, we all have so much going on in a, just a short amount of time to really talk about some really deep and complex issues. This is not the only time that you will have to give your feedback, however, if you hear some point that was also your point and it's already been made, feel free to co-sign that point or make some, some uh, thoughts and suggestions that bring that point farther. But we don't just wanna harp on the same 
idea over and over again without progressing. Um, number eight, let's look for solutions and productivity. So we, of course, have space for thinking about what are issues at hand. So this is not to say, don't bring up your issues. However, we really want to be arming the city of Ferndale with solutions and productive ways that they can move their plans forward. Um, number nine, expect and accept discomfort and unfinished business. So we've got a two hour session to talk about equity and open space. There will be some discomfort and there will be some unfinished business. This is just the beginning of a longer conversation that we hope residents will continue to stay engaged in for a long period of time. Next slide. Um, I could read these slides about disorderly conduct and abusive language and all that stuff, um, but I really think that we're not going to have that issue. However, know that if we do, you're just going to be put out the Zoom. <laughs> but you guys have dedicated a lot of time to be here. So I know that we are all going to show up as compassionate, progressive adults and not do things like bullying, <laughs> right? Nervous laughter. So <laughs> with that said, um, that's just some of our um, counts, uh, City of Ferndale's uh, discourse for dignity rules that um, we're really excited to um, express here. And lastly, I just wanna say um, throughout this conversation, feel free to utilize the chat and to continue to uh, respond in that way. However, when we do the breakout sessions, there will be lots of time that's really focused on um, discourse with um, each other. So going on to the next slide. So um, with that, I am really excited to hand the mic over to Alex, who is going to give you an overview of what Plan Ferndale is all about. What are we working towards um, with this session? So. Thank you, and I'll be happy to pass it to Alex. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Alex Huff, I am also a planner with the Smith Group, the, the planning consulting team, kind of helping to lead this effort uh, with the city of Ferndale and with all of you. So thank you again. Um, we can't say it enough. Appreciate your time um, and feedback. So what we are you know, starting and launching here is where it's kind of under the name of Plan Ferndale, but it really involves three distinct planning efforts um, that we're trying to unify and bring together with a process. Um, so you already have a master land use plan and a parks and rest rep plan. Um, those were updated in, in 2017. Uh, the city updates those every five years. So we're getting a jump start, and we'll be um, adopting in the spring of of next year, but we're now introducing uh, this new component of a climate action plan, which really is spurred from the city's commitments to making real change in climate and resilience. So really looking at this as an integrative and inclusive process, touching on all of these different aspects and really working towards an implementation plan that is cohesive and, and really is achieving these outcomes uh, that we want them to do. Uh, the next slide is just showing kind of uh, what we're in the middle of here with our community summit. We met yesterday on unpacking development. We have this session right now with equitable open space. And if you're available tonight, we also will be talking about climate action uh, starting at 6 p.m. So three sessions to really kick things off. This is not all of the topics. We're not going to get into every single aspect of these three complex plans, but these are some of the things that have been coming to the surface, uh, planning commission meetings, at city council meetings, with staff, with the community. So really thought we'd tackle some of these issues. And we wanted to let you know that the recordings um, of this presentation, the presentation PDFs themselves, they will all be available on the Plan Ferndale website uh, after our meeting. And we're also planning on putting um, our engagement exercises into kind of a print board form and setting those up at City Hall and maybe some other locations. So if you're not able, uh, if you weren't able to, to attend this evening or this afternoon, you'll have another opportunity and sending out as surveys as well. So uh, just a kind of bigger lens again, this is just the beginning. We're really in this first phase of understanding 
Um, we, in addition to these sessions, um, we are also offering mobile input sessions. So we have a number of facilitators ready and willing and excited to engage with you, whether it's with your, your neighborhood group or a certain organization and really deal with some of the priorities and issues and challenges and opportunities that you're seeing um, on the ground. So uh, there is a link um, to sign up for some of those uh, mobile input on our Plan Ferndale website. We also have an online discussion board um, with some topics already uh, set up in there. And it allows you to um, create new topics, comment or post or add things to an ongoing discussion. So really flexible and uh, hopefully uh, accessible to everyone. Um, and then in addition, we'll have some online and paper surveys uh, following in, in the coming weeks here. And so then we're moving into, of course, vetting strategies with all of you, um, analyzing the feedback, and really looking at some of our targets and metrics, um, and coming back to you with some solutions and strategies uh, in the winter and then adopting later in the spring of next year. And the one other piece that we um, wanted to point out as we kind of bring these these plans together of looking at a, a kind of a framework that really brings forth people, place, and systems. Um, each plan is going to have their own way of framing different elements, an emphasis on parks, an emphasis on the way we use land, the emphasis on climate. But these are common themes um, that are important in the way we think about our solutions for the future. And um, as we start to kind of move into this topic of open space specifically, we thought we would open with this idea of vision and values. Um, so I don't intend you to read this screen uh, here, but I wanted to say that we are in this kind of draft development phase of revising some of the vision statements that you had produced um, out of the last master planning process in 2017. Um, those started with, with guiding uh, values such as progressive, equitable, sustainable, and resilient. Um, in working with the Plan Ferndale Steering Committee, we've um, revised some of that language, and we've also looked at potentially adding words like inclusive, healthy, thriving, and connected. Uh, we also had a conversation with the Planning Commission and City Council uh, back September 15th, so just a, a little over a month ago, and they also provided some input on this. So these will also be available on the discussion board online if you'd like to kind of give your input as well. And so um, as we move through this process, there's kind of the overarching plan Ferndale, but also looking at how this applies to the Parks and Rec plan specifically. Um, so this is coming from your 2017 plan, you know, this vision, again, of people, parks, and programs. So a lot of similarities in the way we're thinking about people, uh, place, and systems as well. But this kind of overarching mission as well about improving quality of life. Um, and then pulled some of the goals. This isn't all of them, but really thinking about this emphasis um, in the past five years on uh, program development and really upgrading and ma maintaining facilities and infrastructure that you already own. Um, and, and thinking about recreation as essential, an essential service to our quality of life um, in our community. And then finally, I think this is important about accessibility. And so um, of course, we're going to add to these goals. That's what kind of this process is part of. So how we integrate some of those vision and values um, into what we are doing moving forward. And I think a big thing that Ryan's going to speak to um, is equity and how that um, transpires through kind of open space, how we look at equity using that lens. Thanks, Alex. So defining equity, I think, is... Um you know, a challenge and it's something that we want to talk through today with our panelists and with you. Um, but some of the things that we're thinking about in terms of policies, strategies, actions, and investment that promote equity, we're thinking about age, race, ethnicity, ability, orientation, sexual orientation, gender expression, household composition, education, employment, income, homeowner, renter. How are people being 
or have have been in the past sort of left out or designed against and how can we think about designing for being going beyond uh, statements like inclusive or equity and making actions that are really uplifting and dismantling systemic um, um, barriers that have kept people from being safe and fully actualized in open spaces and in parks. Um, one of the definitions that the city of Ferndale is looking at in regards to equity is here in the uh, corner, fairness and justice and policy, practice and opportunity, consciously designed to address the distinct challenges of non-dominant social groups with an eye to equitable outcomes. So those are some of the issues and questions that we want to unpack today. Yeah, and so to start this process, we are building on the 2017 uh, Parks and Rec plan, as Alex mentioned, and understanding the scale and types of parks available in, uh, in Ferndale, and understanding that community parks, neighborhood parks, and these mini parks all bring benefits of their own types. Uh, they may have different types of amenities, they may be different scales, but they all uh, should be serving the communities in, in which they're located. And so we're conducting an evaluation of the different types of open spaces, the different programs and amenities. And we're asking you uh, how, how you feel those amenities are currently serving uh, the residents of Ferndale and what may be missing. Um, you know, as Ryan said, we're really focusing on this idea of equitable uh, and accessible parks and open spaces. And that takes a lot of different forms. And so, um, you know, we're really, really looking for input here. Um, when we think about accessibility, we think about the physical accessibility. So can you walk to a park? Can you physically get to the public spaces? Um, what are sort of the, the service areas of these spaces? Um, you know, you may have a really high quality park or open space in your neighborhood. Uh, but if you have a very busy road, you may not feel comfortable sending your children um, across the street to go, go take advantage of, of the, the great work there. Um, and so that's, that's one component of thinking of accessibility. But another really important component is the, uh, what happens when you're there. Um, are there opportunities to engage and embrace people of, of all, all abilities, uh, races, age, uh, means, etc.? cetera? Um, is there space for everybody to really be everything they wanna be, to learn and grow and to engage with their families and, and with their neighbors? Um, and, and we also think about how these spaces engage with, with uh, the public throughout different times of year. Um, you know, a lot of times these are, these are spaces in which the communities, community and families uh, can gather and uh, can host events, can find community resources. And so keeping this in mind and looking to uh, different points of reference is, is crucial. Um, and so, you know, we are, when we're thinking about the, the Ferndale open space goals, we're thinking about creating a stronger network of open space and green infrastructure. Uh, so thinking about everything from stormwater management to uh, safe routes to school. And so the, uh, the forms of equity and accessibility can take a lot of different forms. It, it may be that we're providing a space that is comfortable and safe for users. And it's also ensuring that we are uh, you know, building in the, uh, that we're embracing the ecological systems that, that exist here so that we're not uh, exacerbating any of the potential negative impacts of events like, you know, major rain events and that, that we're not um, damaging people's homes or, or having backups or anything. Um, we also want to encourage the health and fitness of Ferndale residents. 
by ensuring that they have access to parks and recreation, that they all have also have access to uh, non-motorized transportation, so opportunities to walk and bike safely, and that we're encouraging the use of these parks by providing access. Um, additionally, we're, we want to, or we're aiming to enhance the engagement with other recreational, recreational entities and groups in Ferndale and coordinating around environmental sustainability, resiliency, social equity, after school activities and new housing. Thank you, Alicia, for giving us a review of what's happening currently and what can happen um, with Ferndale's open space plan. Um, and with that, we're going to transition to our panel discussion. I am pleased to introduce all of our panelists. I'm going to read a little bit about them so that you know who's talking. And following our panel discussion, we're going to have breakout sessions in which you will be able to talk more with the panelists and with design team members about um, your thoughts regarding equity and open space. So you just heard from Alicia Adams, who is an associate landscape architect with Smith Group. In this role, she managed the development of complex urban design projects such as the Joe Lewis Greenway Framework Plan in Detroit. This 27 and a half non-motorized path balances considerations for vacant and underutilized land reuse, equitable economic development, safety and design, and perhaps most importantly, thoughtful, and authentic community and stakeholder engagement. Um, Alicia is currently a student in the University of Michigan Masters of Urban and Regional Planning Program. Um, we will also hear from Lisa Bryant, who is the Deputy Parks and Recreation Director for the City of Ferndale. Prior to joining the City of Ferndale in 2017, Lisa worked for the City of Detroit Parks and Recre Park Recreation Department for over 20 years. Lisa is active across multiple boards, including USA Softball for the State of Michigan, Healthy Kids Inc., Ferndale Youth Assistance, and Lisa is the chair of the M Parks Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Chair for the State of Michigan. Lisa is a former strongman competitor, and her motto is change is constant, be consistent. Uh, we will also hear from Emily O'Bert, who is the chair for the Ferndale Parks and Recreation Commission. She has served the city of Ferndale on this commission since 2016. And while when she is not volunteering in Ferndale, Emily is an experienced design integration engineer who translates human-centered design into engineered products and services for autonomous vehicles at Ford Motor Company. In addition to her role collaborating with design and engineering, Emily is co-president of Ford Empowering Diverse Abilities Employee Research Group, where she amplifies the voices of other employees with disabilities, as well as caregivers and advocates for inclusive products, services, and internal processes. We will, um, lastly, we will be joined by Casey uh, Rashito, um, who is the communications manager at Detroit Justice Center. Casey is an author and artist originally from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. They moved to Detroit in 2014 as the inaugural winner of the Write a House Residency. Formerly a writer in residence at Inside Out Detroit, Casey has taught writing in Detroit Public Schools classrooms across Detroit. They have an MA in Historical Studies from the New School where they wrote their thesis on two Black Panther parties in New York City. So thank you to all of our panelists for being here. And I'm, we're just going to have a free flowing discussion. So some of the questions that I ask may be directed specifically towards you, um, or you, know, you can also just popcorn out and you, you know, it's got something to say, say it. And we want you community members to please participate in the discussion um, through the chat as well. Um, so I just wanna start off by asking you all to tell us each, asking each of you to tell us a little bit more about your work. And from your perspective, what is one of the main things that the city of Ferndale should be thinking about in regards to designing for equity? And perhaps we could start with I guess, Yeah, you look yeah, I was about to say, I guess I'll go first. <laughs> well, um, being is, oh, you know, I'm Parks and Rec through and through. Um, we're always um, looking to be inclusive. Um, when I say be inclusive, that means include not only our residents, which means all of our residents, regardless of ability or what you choose to do as you recreate, but um, also our surrounding neighbors. Um, the more diversity you have, the more fun you have. That's, that's, that's been our motto with everything that we do in, in Parks and Rec. So we always want to make sure that we're not only providing fun, 
but fun for all and in a safe manner. So um, anything that we do in the parks, um, we make sure that we talk to people like Emily. We talk to our surrounding neighbors and everything to make sure that we are doing our best. We don't know it all, but we try. Um, so um, I think anything that we do, we need to do that when planning for um, anything in the parks, um, parks and rec. Um, that's just that's just you know our mantra, and uh, that's what we work hard to do. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, and if we can continue to hear from each of you, tell us a little bit more about your work and what are the thing, one of the main things that the city of Ferndale should be thinking about when designing for equity. I could go next. So um, in my role as the um, chair of the Parks Commission, um, one of our key uh, functions as a commission is to help provide that link between our parks and rec department and our communities um, and residents. And so I think um, it's so important whenever we embark on a new project to get all of those voices um, from all over our community. And so I think one of those key things that our city should be thinking about is who are we hearing from? Who's missing? And how do we bring the people into the room, into the project, um, into, in this case, we're working on our master land use plan, our parks and rec plan, our climate action plan. How do we make sure that we're really hearing everybody and that we're, you know, uplifting some of those voices who might be a little bit quieter? Um, in our feedback. I can go next. Um, so one of the things for me, so I'm the communications manager at the Detroit Justice Center and we are a legal nonprofit. So I work mostly with attorneys, but the overall scope of the work that we do centers largely around the idea of what does it take to keep communities safe, right? And how do communities define their own safety? And one big piece of that is that we have asked hundreds of Detroiters, what would make you feel safe or what would you build instead of a, a new jail? Like, what would you build up to see um bolster your community and it's constantly things like rec centers uh you know what i mean like it's it's programming for kids it's education it's making sure that people who are dealing with mental health crises are not incarcerated for that but are actually getting treatment that they deserve and so um while i'm not a resident of ferndale i think one of the big things that i've been thinking about and we've been thinking about at the detroit justice center is the ecosystem of Metro Detroit, right? It would be one thing to simply address issues in the city of Detroit, which has its own problems. Uh, but I think particularly when it comes to issues around policing, for instance, we see that people who live in the city of Detroit are policed outside of the city of Detroit a lot. And that I think is something that I wanna bring into this conversation, particularly because we're talking about public space, right? And we made graphics this year where we had looked at a bunch of the budgeting and statistics over the last couple of years from Metro Detroit Police Departments. So Ferndale, the population in 2020 is 6.3% black and 59.5 of the people arrested by Ferndale Police Department were black. So that discrepancy sort of tells us immediately where the conversation about equity needs to begin in terms of safety in public space. So that that's sort of what I would bring to the fore in this conversation. Yeah, I think the, the points that everybody's made have been really uh, great. And I just wanna build on Casey's point. I think that the, um, the idea of, of equity and inclusion and is, is making sure people feel comfortable in spaces, um, that they that they feel a sense of ownership over, over the experiences that they're having, um, that they feel as though they belong, that, that they do belong. Um, and, and there are different ways that we can do that, but you know, I think 
really, really pulling people into the, the process of engagement and programming in these the, the education uh, component and, and allowing people to, encouraging people to have uh, a handprint on, on what happens in these public spaces is so crucial to uh, building up the relationship that people have with these kind of really important assets in their communities and and in building up the uh, you know the relationship with their neighbors and and with each other um, and so I, I don't know that I've said anything new but um, I agree with what everyone else has said. Thank you everyone and so many good points were lifted up and I think one of the I kind of want to pull together two ideas. Uh, one was the importance of um, public spaces for our mental health and for healthy, strong infrastructure. So I think um, we also talked about um, within the presentation, and Lisa touched on it as well, um, just proximity, physical proximity to green spaces and open spaces. So I think there's a question there of um, just basic access, but then when it comes to actually being in public, and getting to those public spaces, existing in the public spaces, um, Casey highlighted that there are some inequities there. So if I'm on my way to a park, but I'm afraid because of over policing or over regulation, then I'm then that sort of undercuts. Even if I do have that, you know, proximity, if I feel that I'm um, maybe under attack going there, then that. Those two. So I guess what I'm saying is those two things need to work hand in hand. Um, can people comment a little bit more on what can we do within our um, open spaces and parks to facilitate um, that community safety? And as Alicia mentioned, the reality of belonging. You know, um, I think we talk a lot about you. You know, in theory, we would think this is an open space; anyone can go there. But what actually makes an open space a place where marginalized people can belong. And if well, I didn't uh, articulate that well enough, let me know. I got a little something about that. Um, one of the things that we, we've been trying to do, and, and I can um, thank the Ferndale Police Department and other departments as well as, as our fire and everything, is that we've tried to coordinate our larger events um, with them so that we have them on site, not to police, but to interact. So they've been there um, at events. And, and the younger you begin to interact, the more dialogue you have, the more understanding you have. So um, especially dealing with our, our younger children and everything, we, we try to have the police and fire department and everybody there so that they can interact a little bit more, so that they can all feel a little more comfortable, so that the, the police can be out there and interact and, and become more engaged with the community and not just policing. Their community, they're, they're in the community interacting um, and, and being a part of something that's other than enforcing laws and regulations. So that's been a really, a really good thing for us. And we have a, a community officer who is awesome. And she always tries to get, you know, get out there. And if she can't get out there, she'll get somebody out there and they interact and everything with the children in the community. I think the more that we have that interaction together, the more um, the more understanding we'll have. You know, I, I think that's always a good place to start is to start somewhere where it's neutral, where you you begin to feel comfortable, where you begin to feel safe, where you can see officers such as such as say, "Hey, I saw you at the skate park at at the skate park grand opening," you know, and, and have a dialogue and not just feel feel afraid and and, and retreat because you feel like you know, that interaction is gonna be negative. So I think trying to have more positive interaction um, as, as a parks and rec professional with other professionals has been a good stepping stone um, for uh, Ferndale as a community. And that's, that's just my two cents. Yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's a good step in, sort of creating like connections, right? I think that's kind of the core of a lot of these conversations, right? Is when you're in public space, I think these moments that cause friction in public space tend to be somebody sees somebody that they don't recognize or they think is out of place in a community. 
And instead of being welcoming, right, they use that as an opportunity to sort of say this is an outsider or something like that, right? And so I wanted to highlight another one of those, I, I'm sorry to keep pulling up stats, but that's what I do. Uh, but <laughs> one of the, the biggest things, so this isn't, um, I wouldn't say this is actually a policing problem. This is an interesting thing that we had pulled up out of stats, right? Which is that, um, so last year, 8.7 of the calls to the Ferndale Police Department were labeled as high priority. So that's less than 10%. And that's like huge, you know, like big deal things like robbery assault, right? Which means that they're getting a lot of calls for things that maybe could be mitigated between people and not by the police in the first place. So it's about sort of, for me, creating a culture where people actually feel responsible to the people around them in a way of not policing their behavior or saying like, hey, I don't think you should be in this space or I don't think you live in this building because you look a particular way. It's more about rethinking, like reprogramming your mind to say like, maybe I don't need to call the police for this. Maybe if I went and had a conversation with this person about keeping their music down, I would learn a little bit more about this, you know, um, very loud drummer in my neighborhood or something. <laughs> Yeah, and I also think um, a big part of having everyone find like a sense of belonging and inclusion in our public spaces is having um, activities, whether it's something they're like waiting for them, like a beautiful garden that they want to sit in or a basketball court that people want to play on, or if it's, you know, more like programming, like, a, you know, a soccer team that they can be a part of or coach or, you know, like, it's so important that the spaces can be, you know, activated and even certain parts of it are set aside for having that like contemplation or just laying around, you know, just just being. And so having that like variety of activities and making sure that we really do have something for everyone. That way people don't seem out of place. It's like, oh, this person is in the park using the park and it's obvious and you don't have to wonder why they're there or what they're doing. It's, it's like, oh, they're hanging out in a hammock or, you know, whatever. Awesome. Alicia, did you want to add any points? Okay, great. Um, so from that, it's really interesting that as we talk about equity, this conversation is starting to talk about relationships and community building and placekeeping. Um, so I want to share a quote with you all and just maybe we can respond to that quote. Um, this is um, from Chanel Smith Wiggum. And the quote is, a park is more than just a physical place physical place to build relationships. It's a community tool to amplify people's voices. So uh, once again, a park is more than just a physical place to build relationships. It's a community tool to amplify people's voices. So as we think about um, community building, community connections and strengthening, I guess, our social infrastructure through open spaces, um, what do you think about that quote and how can we build community and kind of start to knit together some of those relationships in Ferndale. Yeah, so um, I can I can start. I, I think that um, you know it's important to tie into the existing infrastructure that's there, the community infrastructure. Um, a lot of people are doing really great work. Um, we, we have a, a few of them on, on the call right now um, and really tapping into the energy, the resources, the investment that people have made uh, in these organizations and, and, um, and, and just, you know, building off of that, that important work uh, as a point of departure, I think is, is a really good place to start. Um, I think a second point is just creating space for, for people to occupy, for people to be. Um, you know, we saw last year that, that a really 
it, there there were a lot of really important events that happened last year and um you know the the ability for people to voice uh their to voice their demands desires their opposition to uh to things that are happening uh in our lives and in in their lives i think is just it's so critical and public spaces fill a really important role in in providing everybody with with uh that opportunity to have a platform to have a, a moment to spend with family with community to um to to either physically occupy the space and to share your voice or to leave something behind through art, through uh, contribution to the space, through programming, uh, just creating, creating those moments. Thank you, Alicia. Um, oh, go ahead, Casey. Yeah, I was just thinking, I, I think Emily and Alicia but both of your points were making me think about my own neighborhood and, and like the park near me. And I think one big thing that comes up in these conversations too about public space is like, I don't know if it's like cultural competency, but like being aware of who lives in a neighborhood and what they're trying to do in the first place, right? So I think about the fact that some of my neighborhood is majority Bengali and Yemeni and the kids in the neighborhood play three sports. They play soccer, cricket, and they play basketball. And there was like a program at one point where somebody tried to build a squash court in the neighborhood thinking that it was going to get the kids to like be involved. And they're like, I don't know what squash, I don't, I'm not, I don't play that sport. I'm not interested. So I think it's like this combination of design and also input, right? From the community, which obviously is what you're all to what we're doing here in the first place, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think that input is so important. And I think people want to see, you know, their, the things they love reflected in public space, because that's, you know, what draws people in. And um, I think it's a great opportunity for this, you know, park planning and recreation planning process um to really get to share that like i can give an example from five years ago the last time we did this so um i'm a wheelchair user i was new to ferndale i hadn't lived here very long um back five years ago and i lived across i still live i live across the street from a park uh, martin road park and i couldn't from the north end of the park there was no accessible entry for a wheelchair user so there's this giant biggest park in the city and I couldn't get into it. And so I came to the master land parks planning process and I drew a line like, hey, we need a path here and we have a path now. I can get into the park. And, you know, I wasn't on the parks commission at the time. It was kind of my, you know, involvement in the planning process is what got me interested in even being on the commission. So I think, you know, it's really important for people to share their needs and share what they value. Oh, I want to see more native plants. I want to, you know, I want this, I want that. We want to hear all those things that you want um, because it will shape our, our public space. Thank you, Emily. Oh, go ahead, Lisa. So um, I just wanted to tell you one thing that that quote is beautiful and I will be using that in future parks and rec discussions. But um, one of the, the many things that we, we try to do too, to you know, piggyback off of that quote, is that meetings such as this, you know, um, I have worked in another community and you know, even though they have meetings, the community doesn't always turn out to voice their, their opinions and their needs and their wants until after something is done. So working in Ferndale, I must say, and I, I commend the, the community, they've always been vocal and involved. You know, um, the best thing, best example is, is Emily, for example. She said she, she just moved and yet she was very open and vocal about the needs that she had to be a part of the park. I think um, a lot of residents can, can maybe echo and maybe not always echo it, but 
we always try to put a lot of thought and planning and meetings into upgrading our parks and making sure that they reflect how, how beautiful the community is. You know, they're very engaged in everything. And I, you know, I, I can't say that enough about, about working in Ferndale. And no, I'm not a politician. I'm not running for anything. I just love the community. But they, um, they're always very vocal. And I, I think one of our, you know, premier parks is Martin Road, you know, and, and the things, the, the upgrades that have happened in Martin Road have happened because of people like Emily and the other people who are here on the call who are here to tell us what they need, what they desire to have in their parks. And, and this is a stepping stone. So I appreciate them. And I just want to say that. Thank you, Lisa. Um, you guys are bringing up um, some great points in regards to um, specific user groups. And so as we think about um, design, I think what I often hear in these type of conversations is let's make a place for everyone. Let's design for all. And so I think that it's important to kind of really call out those user groups that sometimes get lost in the all. You know, I think by default, sometimes we're thinking, is this walkable? We'll say things like that, or, you know, is it inclusive? But what do we mean really when we're thinking about um, inclusivity? So I want to just um, talk a little bit about, you know, what are some specific um, actions that, we want to see happening in regards to designing for people with disabilities, seniors, BIPOC people, children, women, the queer community. I think that each user group may have some barriers to access. So what are some things that we should be thinking about specifically in terms of targeting each of these user groups? I shouldn't say target, what I mean is creating access and making a reality that these places are equitable and welcoming. I was trying to follow the rules and not always jump off as being the first one. <laughs> We're um, panelists, be the first, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, uh, a lot of the things, first of all, um, I think we, we um, as a professional, I have to educate myself and, and know about my community and the needs and um, assess who is, who is, who is one uh, engaging in those parks. Because even though we have, we have 14 parks in Ferndale, in case people didn't know, they all sizes, but uh, each park to me is, is, a different, is, is a different entity. Each park has a different personality because the community that surrounds that park is different, their wants and their needs are different. So I think um, accepting that each park is different and has different um, community members around it that have different needs and wants. For instance, when we started off with the skate park, the community that lived around our initial plan didn't want the skate park. It said, no, this, this is what we need. It wasn't that they were, you know, it was just a horrible idea. They said, no, it's a great idea. It's just not what we need in our park in this community. So we need to move over here and put it over here. And then that, that neighborhood embraced the park and said, yes, we want the park. We, have, we want that, that amenity in our park. So I think recognizing that every amenity is not good for every park, you know, and listening to the community and, and doing what the community asks and not what we think the community wants. So I think addressing people's needs and wants and not what we want as professionals but what the community wants is, is priority number one. Yeah, I think specifically thinking about um, the disabled community, a lot of times we picture kind of the archetypal wheelchair user, which I happen to be, but I also think it's really important. Um, we have a, uh, sizable deaf community here in Ferndale. And then we also have, you know, people with low vision, people with neurodiversity, like autism, depression, um, you know, and so when we think about um, pretty much anything in our park, we want to put an accessibility lens over that. So when we're talking about signage and we're talking about making sure that people can find their way and 
um, then, you know, what our playscapes look like and what our paths look like. And not, it's not that every, every activity, not everyone wants to participate in it, but at making things as accessible and universal as possible. I've heard the, the phrase, like what ing word is the most important in this space? So is it swinging? You're gonna to try to figure out a way that everyone can do some kind of swinging activity in that space, um, for example. I just want to say that that's beautiful. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right on. And I, I think with something like a skate park, it makes sense where it's like, but that where that we're in a neighborhood where they want that, right? When it comes to the sort of equity lens, I feel like that has to be preemptive because you never know who lives in a neighborhood and you want it to be that if someone moves in they already feel comfortable and they don't have to go to the parks department and say hey y'all y'all didn't think about this and now you have to build a whole new pathway right um it's just generally better in with that order of operations for everybody i think yeah i think that's a really good point casey and it makes me I think um, too about um, just the the challenge that I think comes up with community engagement when you know you have you know Lisa you mentioned that you are really fortunate because people are coming and they are at the table um, but I'm I'm thinking about um, how can um, maybe this is a question for Alicia as well coming from you know an architect's perspective but how can we start thinking about um, user groups that maybe have been previously marginalized so they aren't coming to the table. Um, Emily had the wherewithal to say, you're gonna make a path for me, um, but are there user groups out there that we need to be thinking about that have a history of marginalization that aren't uh, pushing for that path? And are there some, are there any examples of design that we can think about where we can be more preemptive with that? And Alicia, if, that, if that's something you want to pass on, that's okay. But I just thought maybe it's interesting to kind of pick your brain as an architect, as a designer. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. And uh, I think it's, sorry, <laughs> gathering my thoughts. Um, I think it, you know, when we think about just baseline kind of physical accessibility standards, we, we think of, sometimes we think of uh, ADA guidelines and, and we really think of those, I think as the, the minimum standard. Um, if, if we're going to really have inclusive spaces, uh, we, have to, we have to engage, as you're saying, Ryan, with, with populations that are able to speak to their needs and their desires. Um, and, and to better understand how we can design spaces that are, are comfortable and enjoyable for, for everyone to use. And I think Emily touched on a lot of those points uh, with regard to the way that we orient signage or create signage. Um, yes, um, <laughs> thanks, Gwen. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, the way that we create paths, uh, that we are creating legible spaces that are navigable, that are, um, that are able to be accessed uh, visually or, or not um, for those that, that um, have, have differing needs. And, um, I think in order to reach these groups, it's not it's not an easy process, as as you know. Um, but really, identifying some of the resource groups, the healthcare providers, uh, really reaching out to uh, everybody in the community to help identify maybe where some of the the gaps are and who we may not be reaching is is critical. Great, yeah, I think that it's always 
you know, you have those who show up, but it's always interesting to look and say, you know, who, ha who is not here that we need to be thinking about. Um, before we go into our breakout questions, I see that the chat has been lively. So I wanna bring forward, I'm, hopefully I haven't missed, you know, we might not be able to get everything, but that's what the breakouts are for. But I wanna bring forward some of the comments that were made in the chat. Um, one was in reference to defining community. Um, Ferndale is a destination, you know, for people who don't live there, you know, people want to go and really enjoy what Ferndale has to offer. So how are the statement was uh, most time we default to residents, but that misses questions of equity, belonging to those who work, go to school, shop, visit and spend time and otherwise participate in the city. Um, would you like to respond to that? Uh, maybe, maybe that's a question for Lisa. Um, in thinking about, you know, how are we, how are you thinking about um, Ferndale's open spaces as a regional draw, if, if we're thinking about that? Uh, well, with a, a lot of our, our programming, we partner with, like I said, the surrounding communities to do um, the bulk of our events, and we invite more than just, uh, you know, our, our normal participants. Um, for instance, with all of our athletics, we partner with all of the surrounding um, groups. Um, just this past uh, soccer season, we invited a group from, from Detroit to come and, and participate. And they emailed immediately after the, the season was over and said they would definitely be back um, to participate again. And it wasn't because of our wonderful programming, partially. But it was also because they felt welcomed by the other communities. They felt um, they enjoyed the, the competition that we were able to, to provide, as well as they, they enjoyed the parents, the atmosphere. So community is about a feeling, about being able to fellowship, um, about sharing a, a space, a safe space, a place. You know, um, So we were able to provide that week in and week out. So I think trying to cultivate that and make sure that you know it is equitable that that it is you know equal as far as that feeling of community um, is something that we work on um, consistently um, in the Rex department. We try as much as possible to make sure that everyone feels safe and welcome. So um, that right there is attributed to our, our volunteers, which are what the community. Um, so I, I can't say it enough. They, they welcomed them. They, they gave them whatever tools they needed to be successful in our league. And um, that's the thing that we're, we're going to continue to promote. I think it's a big part of why we decided to invest um, so much in Schiffer Park too. So a lot of our parks are kind of tucked in in neighborhoods surrounded by houses, but Schiffer Park, which is the one that's behind me, my backdrop, um, is downtown Ferndale. And so that is more um, conveniently located for people who are, you know, working in Ferndale, people who, you know, maybe they want to hang out a little bit before their shift starts at one of our restaurants and it's somewhere where they could go and feel comfortable you know killing some time um, and also it's it's convenient for a lot of people who are visiting ferndale just passing through it's not far from our our big parking garage that we just built so um yeah so we, we do want to put investments where it serves you know the larger community as a whole Jumping on that um, statement about investments, there was a comment in the chat uh, referring to perhaps um, a deficit in investments. Um, the, the, the statement was regarding um, events that are, that are perceived as too large for the city to handle. And so I'm thinking about um, the overall issue that comes up with a lot of parks is the issue of under-resourcing. Um, I wonder, is there opportunity to be thinking about ways to um, resource Ferndale's open space and creative new ways or diverting more resources um, to the park so that um, community members and visitors alike um, have um, equitable and joyful access? So maybe that's a statement, but if anybody wants to comment or respond, um, you know, feel free. I mean, I can tell you where the budget priorities are for Ferndale, where most of the money is going. Guess where is the police? 
and I, and I, you know, I, I, it is literally my job to continually harp on that point, but I, I think part of it is we see disinvestment from communal spaces like rec centers, like parks. And it, I mean, it, it is sort of to a greater scale, I think probably in the city, but I think it probably still happens in Ferndale, right? Where it's like, how do we prioritize making spaces where communities can intermingle, right? Like, how do we, how do we actually make that not just sort of a commitment in our hearts to each other as a community, but a budget priority, right? Um, not that, I mean, beautiful parks are, I feel like one thing that I've seen in, in city planning meetings, right, is that people always think of like parks last as sort of like the, the dressing on the cake because there's bigger infrastructural issues to deal with always. But having access to those spaces makes a huge difference to the people in those communities. And so how do we, how do we recognize that formally? Yeah, Casey, I totally agree with you. I think um, it is easy to put parks last and I could tell you we have scoped down our parks because we didn't have the funding. So we just did the bare minimum grant match. We're out of money from our park bond, like in, like one more big project, like we don't have enough funding to make the spaces everything that the communities want. And, you know, some of that's the reality. We always have more wants than we could possibly have funding for. But the reality is, yeah, Ferndale's budget is spent other places. I, it's the parks, the cobalt survey that we did that showed how, you know, what could Ferndale do to differentiate our community and attract people to live in this you know, really awesome place. It wasn't, you know, fund more public safety. It wasn't, you know, repair like the DVW yard, although goodness knows they need that. But um, it's it's invest in our parks and like our rec center is outdated. Um, right now, you know, our our building is kind of on its last legs and we need some big investment. So it, you know, it's kind of the reality of what we're dealing with right now. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great um, statement to start a transition on as we think about, you know, can we have a call for more investment in the parks? We see, I think, especially in the past couple of years, how important um, these public spaces are for strong social infrastructure, for our mental health, and for a tight knit and um, I guess healthy community. Um, so with that, we are going to transition into some breakout rooms. I am going to pass the mic to Alex shortly, who is going to explain to you um, how we have a little tool that we're gonna utilize for the breakout rooms. Um, but just a couple of notes, um, each, um, but each panelist will go into a separate room. Panelists, you will have a scribe of sorts to assist you um, where you will have, this is just an open conversation that uh, we are having with community members. We're going to utilize a tool called Mural in which um, we can all start to write and um, give comments. The scribe is going to handle, you know, helping write the comments with community members. So facilitators, you can just um, focus on being a facilitator. Um, and then when you go into when we go into the breakouts, facilitators remember to hit record because you will need to do that separately um, within your session. So facilitators or scribes, just make sure somebody um, hit record. As we go into the session, community members, wonderful, beautiful, powerful community members, let's remember the rules of engagement and that we are all here to progressively move forward and develop solutions for this new plan, this new updated plan um, within uh, for Ferndale. So I am going to pass it to Alex, who will give us instructions on the breakout rooms. Yep. So um, you are going to get sorted into a breakout room just momentarily, um, but we'll also drop in the chat, if it's not there already, a link to the mural board. You do not have to join it if you're joining us by your phone and don't have the ability to do two things at once. 
you know, you can just turn on your camera, turn on your mic and share with us your thoughts. It'll really be mostly about a note taking opportunity for um, for us to document our conversations in our group. So um, you don't have to sign up, join an app, download anything. You can just put your name in if you want um, and then click join to the board. And when you land on the page, this is kind of what you'll be looking at. There'll be some helpful hints that pop up um, on the side of your screen about adding sticky notes and images. The one thing I will say, um, there's a toolbar along the left and you can add images and you can even search Ferndale or Ferndale Park. So if there's something in particular you wanna drop, drop in, you, you could do that as well. But um, once you get into your Zoom breakout room, you'll see you're in a group numbered. Um, and so if you can find the board um, in that group, you'll have one of our panelists and then also someone kind of taking notes and we will share our screens too. So if you're, um, you're not able to join there, we can kind of share what we're taking notes on. So we should be all getting pushed into our breakout rooms and we will see you back here in a little bit. Up will be, it'll take just a minute to assign everyone to the rooms and we'll come back um, from this in, at about 4.45 where we can do sort of a share out and, and a recap. Um, so just bear with us as we sort everybody into the rooms. Thank you so much to the panelists and have a great discussion, everyone.
Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the main room. I think uh, we, we, we were hearing some final comments there. Um, so, so if you want to, sh if you were kind of mid-sentence and wanting to kind of finish um, your comment for the, for the whole room, um, then you can definitely um, raise your hand and do so. Um, this space right here, we can just also offer up some high level takeaways um, from our rooms that you'd like to share out to everyone um, broadly. And I see Lynn's hand is up and Trevor. So why don't we start with Lynn and then go on to Trevor. Um, I just wanted to finish what I was, I was answering somebody's question in our room. The, the green space that's next to the high school and behind Detroit Axel right now um, it's, it's, they don't know if it's safe for the public to go onto it because of the contamination. So that's kind of an ongoing thing. We met with the owner um, as a neighborhood group and he went over everything that he's doing. So in the future, he wants to open that up and do something with the city and make it green space, but his hands are tied right now while they're doing um, studies. That's all. Thank you, Lynn. Trevor, would you like to uh, share out to the whole group? Uh, I'm sorry, no, I don't wanna share out to the whole group. I just wanted to share or finish my comment. Um, I'm sorry, um, I just, when we talk about organizational capacity to do things for the um, people within the city, um, I'd like to see some sort of facilitation through the parks that uh, uh, is supportive of a, a keep growing Detroit type organization for Ferndale and Oakland County, um, since those organizations have hard lines and don't serve Oakland County or beyond Detroit. Um, I think that is something that facilitates interaction. So it's not just the place needs, place doesn't need to be special for something. Um, the organization behind it can facilitate it. I guess the place would need to be special to facilitate some kind of gardening. But I think the city should be on board to support a capacity building organization like that to the parks. Thank you. And I'm, I'm glad that everybody got to hear that. That's such a great um, those programs are really great in Detroit and it would be awesome to see something like that happening in Ferndale. Um, so we're open. It would be really exciting to hear any takeaways that folks would like to share to the larger group um, from their breakout sessions. So um, feel free to raise your hand or to unmute yourself and, and share. Well, at the risk of being a person who takes up too much space, but I am a facilitator, so I guess I get to talk a lot. I'll share that, um, oh, I see a couple of hands up, great. Um, I'll share that one of the things that we talked about a lot was the desire for more nature, to feel an oasis, to be immersive in nature. Um, there was a lot of um, discussion about um, the sort of flat nature of some of the parks um, with not a lot of trees and not a lot of foliage or um, places for peace and kind of reflection within that feeling of nature and oasis. So a strong desire to see more plants, more nature, and then the opportunity for residents to also take part in making some of those spaces happen through volunteering. Um, so I see um, Kate's hand is up. So please feel free to share Kate. We were lucky enough to have uh, one of our local teens in our group, which was really awesome. And thanks, Layla. Um, the conversation um, with her, and I think with some of the people who work with um, with young people, uh, we talked a lot about how to convey what what is welcome and and great about our parks, as opposed to just like signage about what's not allowed or you know, shutting down things in racially coded or racially overt ways about, you know, like the basketball hoop is too loud because I don't like the kids who are at the basketball hoop sort of conversation happens in my neighborhood park a lot. Um, so the, the idea of welcoming um, being like an actual really sort of overt welcome statement, um, as well as a physical sense of welcoming was one of the things that, uh, that we talked about in our group. 
Love that. Love it. Awesome. What a quiet and peaceful group you all are, which is great. <laughs> um, not just, great. Oh, go I ahead, will Donna. just share um, what our group started getting into at the end was a bit about reclaiming space that's not necessarily parks, but maybe our streets, our sidewalks, our alleyways, um, that there are definitely some of those opportunities in the downtown area, but maybe some of more of our industrial areas or um, and also this could be temporary. It doesn't have to be like permanent use um, for open space or public space. So I, we didn't get to really dig into that, but I thought that that was a really great conversation that was starting. Something else that came up in our group, I was in Kate's group. Um, people were describing how important it is to have proximity to parks near nearby um, affordable coffee shops and retail so that when people are out and about with their friends shopping, they have a place they can go for a walk after and having more signage um, and directional fun signage that's like a five minute walk this way and just get, getting people out and moving and realizing what local businesses are nearby. Um, and so thinking about parks as part of a bigger, a bigger, um, uh, event that one might have when they're visiting or not just not just for the neighbors but for folks that are um, looking for a place to, to hang out as well. Lovely. I'll also add another uh, point that I'd like to share with every with the whole group that I really thought was interesting was we talked about um, there's the aspect of having um, accessibility within a park, but the pathways to getting to a park. So um, you know there you know maybe this park is walkable. However, you know there's a the issue of um, sidewalks when it comes to um, people who are using a wheelchair or having um, some sort of um, access barrier. So there was the mention of lots of sidewalks um, being in a state of disrepair so that um, you could not utilize um, this sort of non-motorized way of getting around. Um, so I thought that was pretty important. Um, okay, if we don't have, do if we have any more comments to share? If not, we will start to close. I wanted to highlight one thing that came up in our group. It was actually something Kate forefronted. We were talking about sort of how do we deal with this equity issue around sort of like what community safety looks like, right? And like, how do we do that without it always being the police? And so Kate was talking about how at the skate park, there's like a group of dads that are sort of there looking out for the kids who were there, trying to like pick up the litter and also like, teaching them about etiquette in the skate park of like who to go when and how that oftentimes we don't think about it, but there are people within our communities that are already like good at sort of being safety patrol in a lot of ways. Love that, the dad village watching over, <laughs> watching over the park and creating that safety. And it might be one of the reasons that that's one of the most diverse spaces in our in our community. Um, I, I see all sorts of kids and adults and young adults there. So I can't draw a direct causality, you know, like correlation thing, but um, it really is a community space. That's great. The, the skate park has been referenced a lot. And I think that, that it's starting to, you know, sh uh, sort of be lifted up as this place that seems to be ideal in terms of its sense of safety and inclusion and um, access. And it's interesting because I think skate parks can often be the exact opposite, you know, where people kind of view it as, you know, sort of a troublesome space or, you know, a space for the vandal rebel kids or whatever, you know, so whatever's happening in the skate park, it looks like maybe we can learn some lessons to replicate in other spaces. Um, so um, if there aren't any other um, people want to share out, then we can just 
give a little recap on, you know, sort of what are the uh, next opportunities for uh, feedback in the plan overall. Of course, we have one more session tonight dealing with climate change um, at six o'clock. So we hope that you will join us for that session. But I think I'm going to pass it to Alex to um, sort of review um, the different opportunities that um, are available for you to engage in the whole plan. Sorry, I, I couldn't find my unmute um, <laughs> myself. So um, let me just share the slides. So, yep. So just like Ryan said, we have um, our engagement tonight, uh, six to eight, that is focused on climate action. And we will do some similar activities using the mur mural board to really engage in some of these questions. But in a way that like you as an individual, um, can, can kind of feel empowered <laughs> about next steps and not necessarily climate change in the way it can be very scary and very complicated because these are big issues we're facing. Um, but again, we've got the mobile input. Please, um, I encourage you to go to our Plan Ferndale website um, and sign up and, and, and get a facilitator to help meet with your group and hear what's, you know, what's bothering you or what opportunities you see. And again, this online discussion board that you're kind of seeing a snapshot of. Um, we've got a few topics there that you can engage with. We also um, have updated those kind of vision values. So if you have some specific comments on the wording or the way we're thinking about these different ideas specific to Ferndale, please, I encourage you to share those. And we will be um, launching a survey here just shortly or it's actually live now. Um, so we'll send out all the links as well. I know we've thrown a lot of different <laughs> links at you um, this afternoon, but uh, this is really building off a survey that was done in 2017. So a lot of the similar questions so we can kind of get a baseline of how we've been doing the last um, five years, but also some new questions that are really focused on some of the issues and trends that we're seeing currently. So lots of opportunities to engage. And again, we will post all of this on the Plan Ferndale website, the recording, um, the questions, and then the mural boards. Um, you know, we can continue to keep that link open um, through today and into tomorrow uh, if there were some comments that you weren't able um, to add during our live session. So we wanted to just thank you again uh, for joining us and spending your time here with us this afternoon. We, we really, really appreciate this conversation. And it, again, it's only just the beginning. Thank you again to all of our panelists um, who offered their uh, viewpoint and expertise as well. And we hope to see everyone um, at six o'clock. Great job, guys. I really enjoyed that. Yay. Thank you. Yay. <laughs>